Hello and welcome to your homework for Monday, January 13th. Uh, this is a video lecture on the New South. This should go, notes from this assignment should go into your interactive notebook on the right hand side, and this should probably take up about as much space as you usually fill for when we do notes in class. So let's get started. We've already talked a little bit about some of the political changes that were taking place in this country as a part of Reconstruction. Um, this lecture is going to give you a little bit of a different view, but quickly just to review, um, we talked a little bit, first of all, about presidential Reconstruction. In 1865, then President, former Vice President Andrew Johnson created a plan that would have pardoned Southerners um, who would have taken an oath of allegiance to the United States of America. This was actually more lenient than Lincoln's plan, um, and Johnson himself pardoned about 13,000 people in the first year of this plan alone. Uh, he also required that any state that wanted to be re uh, returned to the Union had to come up with a new state constitution and then had to elect a totally new slate of officials. So people who were uh, governors, people who were congressmen, um, all of those people had to be reelected under the new state constitution. He was also going to abolish slavery and his plan would repudiate uh, the Confederate debt. That means that essentially all the debt that the Confederate government had gone into was going to be canceled, which meant that any people who had actually loaned money to the Confederate government weren't going to get that money back again. If none of this sounds familiar to you, uh, you might want to look at Chapter 12, Section 1. That is where information about presidential reconstruction can be found. The other Reconstruction plan uh, that we talked about in class um, is the Reconstruction Act that Congress passes in 1867. So at this point, we're moving from presidential Reconstruction to uh, congressional Reconstruction. That act puts the South under military rule, dividing it up into about five districts. Um, it keeps people who were supporters of the Confederacy from voting, so it actually makes it illegal for them to vote. Um, and it requires them to ratify the 14th Amendment, um, which, as you may remember, is the Equal Protection Amendment and also grants all people who are born in this country citizenship. If that doesn't sound familiar to you, you should probably look at Chapter 12, Section 2. That's where that information can be found. Okay, so if this is sort of the political view of Reconstruction at this time, um, what I want to look at now is uh, more of the economic lens of this time period. What were the new economies that were being created in the South the New South as a result of uh, re Reconstruction policies. A lot of this comes down to a question of land. Former slaves in the South argue uh, at the beginning of this time period that if they're the ones who have been working the land for generations, they have claim to it. They, it is by right belongs to them. So they uh, petition the government in some places for a redistribution of land, taking away those large acreages owned by plantation owners and dividing them up among the former slaves who worked that land. They don't get a lot of political support for this idea. Um, these, the same group of people, these freedmen, most of them do not have any money to actually buy land outside of a redistribution program, which means that their options in terms of um, being able to apply their skills um, in terms of agriculture are very limited. Few whites agree to sell or rent land to blacks. And so some new patterns of ownership and farming emerge during this time. This is a map of um, a plantation from Georgia. Um, and you'll notice up here, this is 1860 and this is 1881. So over the course of about 20 years, um, we see some changes from the left side of the map to the right. During plantation times before the Civil War, all of this would have been owned by the people who would have lived here in the master's house, an entire plantation. After Reconstruction, after the Civil War has come to a close, um, suddenly when the slaves are freed, there are no more people available to work all of this land, which is still owned by the people who lived here. So what um, many landlords in the South end up doing, uh, they don't have enough money to be able to hire workers. Essentially, they have land that needs to be farmed, but they have no money to pay wages. Uh, freed blacks and poor whites who have no money um, and no ability to uh, rent this land um, are willing to work. So what, in order to get farming, farming going again, what the planters do is they actually divide their land up into small farms, and then they rent these pieces out to farmers. So you can see on the right-hand side of this map, all of these 
small plots with different names attached to them are going to be um, smaller uh, groups of families who are farming the land, um, but then have to turn over usually about a third of whatever it is that they make back to their landlord as a form of rent. The name that eventually gets um, applied to this uh, new farming arrangement is called sharecropping. And these people are called sharecroppers. So just to walk through the whole cycle, the way it works is that a sharecropper um, gets land and some seeds, usually for something like cotton, tobacco, whatever the crop is that their landlord wants them to farm, um, and, and a spot of land to work, um, work those crops on. In exchange for that, instead of paying actual money, he agrees that he's going to give um, the landowner back part of the crops that he's able to raise. Again, because the shareholder doesn't have any money, he needs to buy food for his family um, and clothing and farm utensils uh, or farming implements um, at the landowner's store on credit. Um, so he doesn't have a credit card, but the landowner is going to keep track of what he buys and how much money he owes. Sharecropper then goes out, plants and harvests his crop. Um, you can see these are bales of, it looks like, cotton that are being harvested here. And then he brings his ba those bales of cotton or whatever the crop is back to the landowner. The landowner is then going to try to sell those in some larger market somewhere in his area. Um, the sharecropper gets part of the earnings from that, but he also then has to pay back any money that he spent buying things from the landowner's store. At the end of the year, at the end of the harvest cycle, every year the uh, sharecropper and the landowner have to settle up. Um, the sharecropper has to pay anything back that he owes, anything um, that he uh, owes from what he bought on credit. And in many cases at this point in the cycle, um, some landowners were credible people and actually uh, some sharecroppers were able to make a very, very meager profit off of this. But many landowners also took advantage of the fact that their workers were in many cases illiterate um, and cheated them out of uh, maybe profits that they could have owned. In both cases, the sharecropper has very, very little money at the end of this whole cycle. And so promises, instead of being able to take that money and move on to try to buy their own land, they decide that they'll promise to stay on for another year. And then the whole cycle continues, repeats itself. Sharecropping is not the only option. Um, tenant farming also becomes a, an option for people at this time. Um, these, If you are a tenant farmer, you are someone who does not have enough money to be able to purchase your own plot of land, but you can rent land from a landlord um, in the same way that uh, you might pay rent to live in an apartment today. You're going to pay them with actual money as opposed to crops. If you're a tenant farmer, you get to choose which crops you want to plant, when you want to harvest them, how you want to arrange your fields, what kind of animals and farm uh, implements you need to purchase in order to support you. In most of these cases, cash crops are going to be um, encouraged over food crops. Cash crops are things like cotton, tobacco, indigo, rice, things that um, maybe are going to be more valuable in bulk um, and in manufacturing than things like corn or potatoes or tomatoes or things that you can actually eat and feed your family with. Um, this means that in many cases, the tenant farmer may not actually have money uh, or may not actually have food um, to be able to provide for their family, so they may need to buy food elsewhere. Um, unlike sharecroppers who have very little control over their lives, tenant farmers do have a little bit more independence, which means that they end up having a somewhat higher social status in the South during this time period. In the New South, farming is still going to be the major driver of the economy. Um, most money that's going to be made is going to be made related to farming in some way. But there are some new jobs that start to emerge for people in the South during this time period. Um, a couple of them are related directly to sharecropping or tenant farming. Um, during this time period, we see a rise of merchants um, and a spread of general stores. This um, is sort of a photograph of an interior of a general store. Um, these stores would have maybe been run by a landowner um, on a former plantation and would have been the places where both sharecroppers and tenant farmers would have had to essentially purchase all of their goods, their clothes, um, their food. You can see in this picture there are um, 
dry goods sort of in this area. There are canned goods back here. There are lamps, um, all sorts of materials that uh, you need in order to um, make your house a home. Um, and all of that, of course, is going to cost money. Um, if you don't have money, these stores will be able to sell you goods on credit, uh, but then those creditors may come back to you after a while. If you don't have enough money to pay them back, they can then take back all of the things that they have sold you or lent to you on credit. Um, and that you see this sort of cycle of poverty emerge in the South where people get a little bit of money, are able to buy some goods for themselves, only to lose those goods to their creditors um, as soon as they start to feel like they have it, some independence. Also at this time, um, in, starting in about 1865, industrialization and the Industrial Revolution have finally come to the South. Um, so this means uh, that there are more trades available for people, more occupations than just farming or selling things to farmers. Mining expands dramatically during this time period, um, particularly in the region that's called Appalachia. Um, this is a, a region of the country that stretches from about Maryland down to Alabama along the Appalachian mountain range. They're mining for uh, not only iron, but also coal during this time, and coal is still um, important to this region today. If you're a fan of the Hunger Games, or particularly if you've seen the movies, um, District 12, where Katniss comes from, is supposed to be Appalachia. Um, finding things like iron and co uh, coal are critical to helping the South um, rebuild some of their railroads, and they actually end up expanding their railroads dramatically during this time period. The Southern Railroad System, which you may recall um, from our Civil War comparison of the North and the South, was um, dramatically smaller than the North during this time. Um, the Southern System doubles between um, 18, whoops, those dates are backwards, 1860 and 1890. It doubles over about a 30-year period. Um, there are also small factories that emerge in the South. Um, some business leaders are able to pool together enough money, um, are able to repair some buildings uh, to actually get some small manufacturing going. These are primarily things like cotton and flour mills, um, so uh, factories that are going to take raw products from agriculture and turn them into um, consumer products. Um, some of these are also furniture and tobacco factories as well. Most of the people who work in these places are mostly poor whites. Very few blacks have jobs in these particular factories. In the factories, you're going to be working 12 hours a day um, for about six days a week. There are no laws at this time restricting how many hours you work during the week, and there aren't really, there's not really a much of a concept of a weekend at this time. Um, for your effort, you might be making around 16 cents a day. Similar to sharecroppers and tenant farmers, um, people who work in factories are totally dependent on the factory owners, not only for their jobs, but in many cases for their houses and for their food supplies as well. So the general stores um, cater not only to farming communities, but also to some of these factory communities as well. The similarity in both cases is that they are controlled and owned, um, which means that the profits uh, are then taken um, by the people who also own the land or own the factory. The things that factories are producing in the South are also very different from what factories are producing in the North. Um, in the South, uh, they tend to be earlier sort of in the industrial chain from raw material to finished good. So something like lumber is going to be coming from the South, while the North is making things like fine furniture, dyed fabric, things like that, which are also typically going to be getting more money um, or are worth more money um, in terms of sales at this time. So while factories in the South are making um, a fair amount of money during this time, uh, their, their profits increase in some places by literally millions of dollars. Um, the North is still, in terms of in industry and manufacturing, making dramatically more from those um, trades than the South is. Expanding the railroad system is not the only um, industrial sort of job that people work on during this time. Um, the entire infrastructure, which is a key term for you, um, of the South needs to be rebuilt. Infrastructure refers to public property and services. Um, so everything from roads, bridges, 
canals, telegraph um, lines, railroads, um, to things like public school systems. All of that needs to be either rebuilt or created during Reconstruction. Um, in the North, uh, public school systems had existed for many years at this point, but in the South, um, we first start seeing public schools um, and public school districts emerge during the period of Reconstruction. So the question, of course, becomes this. How is this going to be paid for? And the answer, which you may be anticipating, is, of course, taxes. Um, by the end of the 1870s, the Southern debt increases another $130 million. It is incredibly expensive to put all of these things back together. The people in the South are not seeing a lot of that money come directly to them. In many cases, they're sharecroppers, they're tenant farmers, they're working in factories, they're working on the railroad, but they're making incredibly low wages, no more than maybe 50 cents to a dollar if you have a good paying job at this time. Um, so while the economy in the South and finally, it looks like it's starting to catch up to the North in some ways, and it is rebounding from the Civil War. There is a great deal of tension in this society, particularly around economic issues. So that's it, guys. That is the New South. Please be sure to bring your interactive notebook notes with you to class tomorrow. You will need them for what we're going to be doing together as a group.